Thank you so much for calling us family, letting some Texans be a part of New England. I don't know if I told you this last time I was here, but Mary is actually, she considers Connecticut home. So I'm hoping that maybe somehow that gets me a little more like street cred with you guys. Did you notice I said you guys instead of y'all? All right, I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay, we were laughing at lunch about the, uh, you know, the wine digression thing, session by session. I just said, I, I guess I'm grape juice here. We go with that. <laughs> All right, Mark chapter one is Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Verse 17, one more time. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. It's interesting to me that the call to discipleship is implicit from day one with Jesus. Come follow me, and not that I will make you into men or great people, but I want to do something in you so that I can do something through you. And that, at the very invitation this heart of discipleship, that what God does in us, he wants to do through us. It's there at the very introduction of the call of God to our lives. And so grateful for um, Nick's message last night. Thank you so much for that. Um, difference between the call and the assignment. That was very helpful to me. I hope it was, how many of you guys, it was helpful to you. So, so helpful to me. But I do believe that we're all called to make disciples. I think that's part of our discipleship in Christ is that we are also called to then make disciples. And we'll talk that through a little bit as we move along here. I think last time I was with you, I shared just a, a, a brief piece of my own kind of personal story. I don't want to um, replicate that too much other than maybe uh, to, to make this point. I will say this, that I grew up unchurched. I found myself on a college campus. I met a bunch of young people who loved Jesus. They were part of a community called Chi Alpha. And they loved me, cared more about my future than I did. They showed me Jesus. They won me to Christ. And the way that kind of transpired was over the course of a couple of months, I found myself in a, in a, in a Bible study setting. And uh, that kind of culminated one night with this Chi Alpha intern preaching about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I had grown up completely unchurched. Uh, third generation unchurched, matter of fact, and I had never heard that Jesus was coming back. And I, I remember there, and I'd, I'd love to show you this just to make the point. I was, I was sitting in my chair, and my knees were literally shaking. Uh, there, so much fear in my heart as this preacher. He was a hellfire brimstone preacher. You guys remember those kind of preachers? Don't point at anybody next to you. He painted such a picture of what it was going to be like if you miss the rapture that you ought not to miss the rapture, right? And the power of God was actually so strong in the room. I'd never felt anything like this being completely unchurched, but my body was literally shaking. And I, I remember thinking there were only two other folks in the room. There was, um, it was an athlete Bible study, and there was another fellow from the water polo team, which is what I was part of. And then there was a quarterback from the football team. And I remember thinking to myself, these, these dudes are going to think I'm weak. And so I, I tried to stop my knees from shaking by leaning down and putting a little weight. And then, you know, that just made my whole body shake because <laughs> the power of God was so strong in the room. And after an hour long sermon of pointing and shouting and screaming and um, all of the things that went along with the kind of hellfire brimstone kind of message that was going on. He gave us an opportunity to, to lift our hands and, and, and say a prayer to invite Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, to come into our hearts and change our lives. And, that, you know, I, I did that. I did that that night. And guess what happened? Well, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, came into my heart and he changed my life. But this um, Pentecostal preacher with Chi Alpha wasn't content there. He, um, he said, now that you're saved, you need, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
Now, how many understand if I'd never heard that Jesus was coming back, I'd never heard of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so he preached another hour and a half. I'm not making this up. He preached another hour and a half going from Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, all the way through the book of Revelation, talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gift of speaking in tongues, et cetera. I didn't know anything he was talking about. I just knew that my body was still shaking. That night, he gave us opportunity to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and my hand went up again. And um, that, that young preacher, that young Chi Alpha intern, he laid hands on me that night. This, the meeting had been three hours at this point. And he laid hands on me that night and prayed for me to be baptized in the Spirit. Now, he didn't speak in tongues over me. The first person I ever heard speak in tongues was me as the power of God shot through my body, and I began to speak in a language that I'd never learned as I was filled with the Holy Spirit. That was on a college campus, in a secular college campus, Wendell Phillips Center, room number 140. I remember it like it was yesterday. And the reason I take a little bit of time to tell, to tell that, at the risk of maybe repetition from last time I was with you, is that I, I want to say I don't know a whole lot of folks that have had a more abrupt and radical conversion experience, and I, I wish I could tell you more about the kind of pre-Christ days, but the most selfish person on the planet, probably, to being saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit in one night. I, I don't know a whole lot of people who have had a more sudden and abrupt and radical conversion experience, but even with that, I want to fast forward another four to six months, and I was sitting in my dormitory one night, and I was quitting walking with Jesus. And what was going on in my head was something like this. God, I know you're real. I believe that you love me. I believe what you did on the cross was for me, but I don't know how to walk with you. I don't know how to live a life above sin. I there, there, there's, there's probably people that can do this, but obviously I'm not one of them. And I was, I was actually saying, I'm sorry, God, but I just can't do this anymore. Because I obviously don't have what it takes to be a man of God and to follow you. And it was right about that time that God sent into my life what I'll just call a big brother in Christ, in other words, a discipler, someone to actually put his arm around me and begin to teach me how to read the scripture for myself, to understand how grace works, to understand when you fall, you get back up, to understand the importance of community, to understand the importance of actually sharing my faith with it. all these things that we talk about in discipleship. God gave me somebody to disciple me. I think last time I was with you, I talked about an, an older gentleman that, that came into my life, a pastor of a local church, and I salute those of you who are leaders in your local church and different ministries who are discipling young people in your church context, because God gave me a father in the Lord as well. But the reason I kind of take a little time to say that is because I, I just know that so, for so many of us, we, as Pentecostal people, we have this idea that if we can... If we can just get them to say the prayer, then that'll take care of everything. And without actually being born again, without the heart transformation that David so powerfully talked to us about just recently, just earlier before lunch, we're not going to make disciples. But I also want to tell you that God is actually giving us the dignity of cooperation with him in the disciple making process. And there's nothing that's greater than that. And I'm so grateful because I, I would tell you that without disciples in my life, even though I had that powerful conversion experience, I know that I wouldn't be here today. Nick's asked me to share a little bit of um, kind of our story at ministry there at Sam Houston State University. We, Mary and I were the, 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 we started Chi Alpha at Sam Houston State University. It's in a little place called Huntsville, Texas. Most of you are not even heard of, but we were there on that university campus for 27 years as 
as Chi Alpha directors or Chi Alpha pastors there. About four years ago, we transitioned that um, away from that and handed that off to one of my best friends in the world, Jason Bell, who's currently leading that. Some of the Chi Alpha folks that are up here serving in the city in Boston today are out of that ministry as well. And that ministry over 27 years, over 30, 30 years now, has um, the, the smile of the Lord has just been upon it. And um, there have been hundreds and hundreds of credentialed Assembly of God ministers and missionaries that have come out of that little place that nobody has heard of. Thousands of disciples made that are um, scattered around in different churches, Assembly of God and otherwise, of course, churches throughout the U.S. and around the world. And so Nick just asked me to tell you a little bit of that story and, um, and how that kind of transpired. And the, the emphasis really has always been on discipleship. And um, at the risk of uh, kind of belaboring this point of what is the mission of God and what is the Great Commission and how do we make disciples, I just want to tell you a little bit of the story of what God did there. I, you know, as we got, as we, this, you know, my, my story happened in California. When we got back to Huntsville, I, I'd been saved about a year. And when I say a year, I mean, you know, a year of once a month church attendance. You know what once a month church attendance kind of does. I was one of those guys. But um, the, old, the old pastor at the church, the old, he was an old man at that time, he just kind of pushed me to the front and said, you're the new Chi Alpha director. And I was a little more afraid of him than I was the microphone. You know what I'm saying? And so, so I, yeah, okay, here we go. But we were so green, and we were just talking in, um, during lunch that last time I shared that, the responsibility is the miracle grow of the kingdom of God. And actually accepting responsibility for souls is the thing that will actually propel growth in the kingdom of God. So that was kind of our story. But I found myself in this place where we began to have a burden, a real burden for the campus. And at that time, the campus was about 15,000 students, which sounds small to you, but as a young man saved about a year, I, that seemed, it might have been, it might as well have been 15 million. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How, how are we gonna reach the campus? And um, I, re I remember looking at the campus and thinking, Lord, you've got to have a better choice than, than me to do this. But I felt this burden. And so the question became, how do, you, how do you make your life count here? What do you do? And we attended a thing. Nationally, Chi Alpha was um, hosting a training event called Reach the University. And I want to honor a man named Harvey Herman Jr., who had written a book called Discipleship by Design. And basically what he did is he took Robert Coleman's Master Plan of Evangelism, that classic book, and he contextualized that to the university campus. And he talked about the power of disciple making and the power of small group discipleship in a local university context. And that's when it clicked in my heart that primarily my transformation had not just been about what happened on the stage, but about what happened in the small group context. And then the strategy all began to unfold. And for the next 25 years, we made it our goal to make disciples. And when we look at Jesus and what he did, and how he spent his time, his limited time, and how he invested in his disciples. I, I would say this, how many, of, how many of you have either said this or heard something like this? We, we, we tend as preachers to say, you know, the message can never change, but methods change all the time. How many of you have said something like that? Or you, 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 in, and there's a measure of truth in that. There, there really is a measure of truth in that. And we, we're not going to touch the, the message. So the message always stays the same. But, you know, methodologies change, etc. But my pushback on that is this. How many understand that Jesus was smart? Like capital S smart, right? And so perhaps we'd be wise if we looked at not only what he said, but also what he did. Not only his message, but also his method. How did he spend his time? How did he invest his time? And when you do that, you, you begin to see that Jesus, especially as his time was shortening, in other words, the second half of that three or three and a half years of his public ministry, you find him kind of shying away from the crowds and spending more and more time with his disciples. 
and investing in them. It's almost like at a certain point, he begins to avoid the crowds and invest in disciples. That's his method. And when we study his life, we find out that he, you know, Jesus, Jesus loved the multitudes. He looked at the multitudes. He wept over the multitudes. He fed the multitudes. He healed the multitudes. He taught the multitudes, right? He, he died for the multitudes. But he never went looking for the multitudes. And he actually wasn't calling them to come to himself. What he did call was a, a small group where he chose to spend his best time, his primary time was in a group of 12 men and some ladies, by the way, the subject of another sermon, that were close followers. Jesus was a disciple maker. He was, and he still is, in the men-making business. And this, for me, is... As a young man with a burden for a college campus, I, I began to look at the churches around me, and, I, and pretty quickly, I got the idea that if you want to make a difference, if you want to change the world, if you want to do something powerful for God, then what you need is a big stage and a loud microphone and a sound system, and more importantly, you need to be the kind of person that's articulate, eloquent, can, can preach the gospel, that knows the scripture, but what if you're not that? What if you're, what if you're a 20-year-old kid that just got saved and you, you don't even know the New Testament from the Old Testament? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I remember I started going to Sunday school and they told me that, you know, I read these stories about Jonah, Noah, and Moses, and they got all mixed up in my mind because I never read the Bible before. And I thought Jonah, you know, Noah, Moses, I guess the same guy that built the ark fell off of it, got swallowed by a whale. I, like, that's what I would, that's what I would preach. So what if you're, what if you're not the super evangelist that so much of the church in the West has been built upon over the last number of decades? And we began to study this, and Selwyn kind of walked us through this last time I was with you. So for brevity's sake, I'll just, I'll, I'll do this quickly, but I, let's just run some numbers. Let's, when you look at the methodology of, of typical church ministry in the West over the last number of decades, you see this kind of super evangelist kind of thing happening. Let's just say, for example, just for argument's sake, let's say you have a super evangelist. You have one of those people, one of those men or women that's just, they're, they're articulate, they're well-versed, they're anointed, and they preach the gospel in such a way that they see 1,000 people come to Jesus every day, and let's just run those numbers for a 10-year period. Well, that, you know, let's say we don't even give them a Sabbath, so let's say 365 days a year, 1,000 converts per day because they've got a big stage and a big crowd and a big church, and that at the end of year one is 365,000 people, right? But what if you're not that? What if you don't have a microphone? What if you don't have a stage? What if, you don't, what if you're not that good there? And you're just a disciple, but you got a burden, and you want your life to count. Well, let's call this the faithful discipleship method. Let's say you just go out, and you find five young men, if you're, if you're a young man, or five young women, if you're a young lady, and you just make disciples. You just be the best big brother or big sister, or depending on your age, maybe spiritual father or spiritual mother that you can be to them. And you pour your life into them, and you teach them how to do the same. And every year you do that. Well, okay, so let's just run some numbers. At the end of year one, the super evangelist has 1,000 converts a day. That's 365,000 souls, right? And I think we have, do we have a, a slide that we can put up? Oh, man, it looks different to me. Oh, wow. 365 or six. Okay, so let's do, the, let's do the numbers. At the end of year three, the super evangelist is still, he's preaching the gospel. She's preaching the gospel in a way that's 1,000 people a day, so that takes you up over a million. Well, the six in year two go out and find six, six more. You got 36 there. 
because it's me and my five, that makes a six, and then 36, and then 216, then you're six, you see what's happening here, and we don't have to belabor this. This is, by the way, why you don't get into credit card debt. It's called compound interest. Okay, we'll jump up to year eight. Okay, so at, you see early on, it doesn't appear as though Jesus is smart. Because he keeps, you remember what we said, he keeps reluctantly ministering to the crowd. It's not reluctantly, that's not a great way to say it, but he keeps shying away from that to spend more time, choosing to spend more time with the people who will be able to minister to the crowds after his departure. But you see, he starts to look really smart here in year eight, year nine, and year 10. Look what happens. Isn't that profound? So how many understand Jesus knew what he was doing? And when he gave us the Great Commission, he still knew what he was doing because he was trying to empower or mobilize the people of God to make disciples and to reach the world. So here's the thing. Jesus was never content with an audience. What he wanted was an army. And so what you and I, as ministers of the gospel, the decision we've got to make is, are we content with an audience? Or do we want an army? of disciple makers. Now, some of you, you're, you're really astute and you're smart and you're saying, well, wait a minute, that whole thing is dependent upon every disciple making disciples. And at any given point, if there's failure along the way, that greatly affects these numbers, right? Yes, that's very true. And that's what we call transgenerational discipleship. So in 2 Timothy 2.2, again, I think either David last year or, or Selwyn kind of dealt with this, so let, let's just do this quickly. But in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul tells Timothy, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable or faithful people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, what we love about this verse is that in one verse, you see four generations of Christians. That's fantastic. One verse, four generations. Paul gave something to Timothy Timothy, you need to give that to reliable people, and those reliable people can give that away to others as well. You see, remember what we said in the beginning. We're not just making men and women of God. We're making disciple makers. Some of you aren't tracking with me, so let me, let me give you a personal illustration. My last name is Gautreaux, um, G-A-U-T-R-E-A-U-X, just like it sounds. It's a Louisiana name, French roots, Cajun. I don't know if there's anybody here from Louisiana, obviously not, or if you are, you're scared to say so because you made no noise. It's a beautiful name, um, but I, I have two daughters. My dad's, you know, sad because he had two boys, but I had two girls and my brother had two girls. So, guess what that means for the family name? All right, my, my daughters are now Murphy and Pitt. That's their last name. They traded Gotro for, you know, what they think is a better name. I don't think so. My brothers, one of, one of his girls is married. The other one will be soon. And it's the end of the line for this name, Gotro. So, my dad's name it is it's like it stops here. If, if I'm honest, I will tell you, we do have some cousins over in Louisiana, but we're kind of hoping they don't procreate. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> as far as the, as far as the true line, <laughs> the pure line, it ends here. Like, it's, it's over. So, what we're saying is that Everybody in the room here has a spiritual lineage. We have a, a spiritual family tree. And what's been entrusted to us must be given to the next generation in such a way that they can there give it to the next generation as well. That's the crux of this whole matter. Making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And when Jesus called his disciples, he said, if you come follow me, I'm not just going to help you be a better person but I'm going to help you make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. This is the thing. So we'll end with this again. This is kind of just 
very simplistic, but I want to give you an example. We have a picture from Sam Houston State University. So remember, this is a, oh yeah, this is a, um, this is one of our spiritual family trees. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about these guys. Paul Brown actually over here, he graduated uh, with, with Mary and I. So I said, Mary and I launched Chi Alpha there, but Paul actually was the third. He helped us. He was a student. He graduated and he's worked in the marketplace ever since. He's been a tent maker. He still helps us to this day, uh, 30, 30 years later. Um, but Paul is amazing. He, um, he had a heart as a student even though he was working full-time, going to school. We used to call Walmart Paul Mart because he was an assistant manager, even as a student. He was up there. So, but he found capacity in his heart to invest his life in disciple-making. And one of the young men that he found was Terry Roberts. Terry Roberts came to university. He was actually an AG kid um, who came to university trying to run away from God. <laughs> he, he was trying to get away from Jesus and, um, and was doing a good job of that. He was one of those guys, when you saw him on campus, when he saw the pastor, he'd duck and look, the, you know, and act like he didn't see you. But Paul actually went, was the best big brother Terry ever had, loved him back to Jesus, and discipled him. I remember Terry actually saw, he sat through a teaching, kind of like what we're doing today, uh, a little more comprehensive, but he, um, he came up to me after the class, and he said, you know what? I want to do what Jesus did. I want, to, I want to make disciples who make disciples. I want to change the world from Huntsville. Um, and, but I, he said, I, I got a part-time job. Terry was on the football team at Sam Houston State. Um, and he's saying, you're telling me that this is not a once-a-week Bible study, but this is life on life, pouring my life into other people, being the best big brother they ever had. I, he said, in, in academics, he said, I can't do all of that. Something's got to give. He said, I, I feel like in my heart today, God told me that I'm, I'm to give up. I'm to walk away from the football team. I'm going to give up playing football, which had been his dream forever, and he was quite good. And when he said that, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to give up football to make disciples. I said, Terry, you, you, you're going to change the world. This is, you're, you're going to do it. And so he went out the next year, and he found this guy named Steve Kutno. Steve was this lost kid that came to college, and he wanted to play basketball. You can tell he's tall. And because Terry had been a football player, they connected over that. And Terry just did the same thing. He just loved Steve. He won him to Jesus. Now, this is all we can talk about the processes at some other point, but this takes time. He won him to Jesus, saw him baptized in the Holy Spirit. Steve got a hold of this, and he said, man, I'd love to, I'd love to do the same thing. So the next year, he went out and found this kid named Matt Hugendorn. Now, Matt was actually another church kid from a Pentecostal background, not A.G., who was, who was not walking with God, but Steve loved him back into the kingdom, saw him get right with God. Matt wanted to go do the same. By the way, you'll notice that it's about half what we call church kids and half pagan kids. That's like our favorite mix on campus. We, we generally, when we do leadership training, we make them play dodgeball against each other. The pagan kids, they're not pagan kids anymore, they got saved, but you know, the pagan kids against the church kids. And what we find is, you know, the pagan kids are mean. They'll, they'll, they'll like throw that ball and hit you in the face and laugh at you. But the church kids are sneaky. So Matt, Matt got right with God. He, he did the same. He went out the next year and he found this kid named Ryan Volkmer, total pagan kid. Ryan was the guy that brought a different girl to Chi Alpha every week. Ladies, afterwards, you can explain that to me if it's got something to do with the white legs. I don't know <laughs> to this day how that was. But he got right with God. And the next year, he went out and he found this guy, Josh Renfro, who was total drunk, basically. He was a rodeo clown. That's the way he paid his way through college. I've got pictures of him dressed in rodeo clown, like thrown 10 feet in the air by bulls. So it'll tell you something about how, you know, he's brave and he's a bulldog, but he was just basically a drunk. He got right with God. Then he went out the next year and he found Ryota, who was a Buddhist kid from Japan, who had come to study at the university. And I, I need to tell you, where those guys are at right now. So Paul is still a tent maker. He's, um, he, he's still never preached a sermon. He's, he doesn't, he's uncomfortable with a microphone. 
but he's made disciples who have made disciples who have made disciples. I wish I had the time to tell you off of, this is one branch. Terry's just one of his disciples. Jason Bell, Josh Bell, these are other leaders. I wish I could take you down these other family trees. Terry Roberts, he's a custom home builder down in the Houston, Texas area. He's been a deacon at his local Assembly of God Church all these years, filled in as youth pastor when necessary. Um, his wife is a worship leader there. But again, Terry is a marketplace guy. He's not a preacher. He's, he's, he's just a minister for Jesus in the local church context. Steve Cutno is an Assembly of God World Mission missionary. He served two terms in the Czech Republic, one of the most atheistic nations on the planet. He's currently uh, serving in the Arab world in an undisclosed location. <laughs> and then um, Matt Hugendorn is a missionary to the University of Houston with Chi Alpha, winning people to Jesus all the time down there. Ryan Volkmer is Marketplace. He is assistant district attorney for the city of Houston. Uh, last I heard, he had never lost a case. And Ryan, and, and he's helped start small groups in one of the largest churches in the city of Houston, discipleship context there. Josh Renfro is an Assembly of God world missionary in the nation of Chile, he was just named area director for Southern Cone of Latin America and sits as the chair of the World Congress of University Student Ministry for Assembly of God World Missions. Uh, Ryota had gone back to Japan to be a youth pastor um, and sent me all kind of pictures of junior high students that he was winning to Jesus in Japan. He's since come back to the U.S. where he married another Japanese international student that was studying at the University of Texas, Austin. They've recently transitioned and started a brand new Chi Alpha ministry at the University of Texas at Arlington, which has over 5,000 international students representing almost every nation in the world. And they're winning international students to Jesus, then sending them home. So... That's so long. That's so long and I'm out of time. But the reason I tell you that story is because I happened to be, before this picture was ever taken, we, we, we got lucky, lucky when we got this picture because you see the different generations here. They're never in the same room. And we just happened to have an alumni event. It dawned on somebody that those guys were related through the spiritual lineage family tree thing. And so we got this picture as an illustration but before this picture was taken, I was in a meeting at an Assembly of God district banquet where Terry Roberts was in the same room as, as Josh Renfro, but they'd never met each other. And it dawned on me, oh, they need to know each other. So I went and I grabbed, there's like 500 people in the room at a banquet, banquet style table, big giant gymnasium conference center thing. So I went and I grabbed Terry and, uh, and I said, hey, Terry, you see, you see across the room there, you see that guy? Josh Renfro, and he, you know, we identified him. I said, you don't know him, right? And he said, no, I don't know him. I said, well, that's your spiritual great-great-grandchild. He said, what are you talking about? I said, do you remember that day that you told me you were going to quit playing football in order to make disciples? Do you remember, do you remember what I told you? He said, yeah, you told me I was going to change the world. I said, well, did you do it? Did you change the world? He said, no, I didn't change the world. I just love five 18-year-old kids. And then I marched him around the globe. And I told him what God was doing in the Czech Republic. That there would be not one or two, not 10 or 20, but hundreds, if not thousands of people in heaven forever because of the ministry of the cut nose. I walked him over to Asia and told him what Ryota was doing in Japan, not one or two or 10 or 20, but hundreds, thousands of people in heaven forever because of Ryota's ministry. And then I walked him down to South America where the Renfros had already started more than 20 Chi Alpha groups in the nation of Chile. And I said, there'd be thousands upon thousands of people in heaven forever because of what's happening there through the ministry of the Renfros. We walked around the whole globe and I looked at him, I said, Terry, you didn't just disciple five young men. You did it, man. You changed the world. You see, to us, this is not rhetoric. This is not rhetoric. This is reality to us. And I, wish I, had, I wish I had time to take you down these spiritual 
family trees. Ryan Volkmer, I could, I could branch off of him and tell you about Josh, who lost kid who got saved. He's, he's in the Arab world right now planning, planting churches. He discipled, he won to Jesus, a guy named Sir James Olford, who's planting Chi Alpha at a historically black college and university, Prairie View A&M, outside of Houston, Texas, and how he discipled Blake Roach, who's the right-hand man to the governor of Texas. I, it's just influence beyond influence. And what, what God told Abraham, he said, walk out of your tent and just look up at the night sky. Can you count the stars? Look at, look at the sand of the seashore. Can you count them? What's the point of all this? I, how do you make a difference? How do you make your life count? Let me tell you something. You don't need a microphone and you don't need a stage. Just find a handful of people and pour your heart and your life into them. Teach them how to do the same. And we can change the world. Father, make this more than a good idea. Help us to see that this is actually the ancient, proven, biblical method of Jesus Christ. This is not plan B. This is plan A. That you have called us to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. I pray blessings on my friends who are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us attack our assignment with vigor to make disciples, Lord, even when it's hard, like Pastor Nick said. May we uphold Jesus like David told us about. Let, let us uphold Jesus in such a way that we see lives transformed. And thank you for the dignity of participation in the Great Commission. We love you. In Jesus' name, be blessed. <laughs>